Okay, this morning we're going to uh, start with uh, a reading of Psalm 122, just verse 1. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand and we'll begin our worship this morning <laughs> as we gather. judgment 
for all that are oppressed. He make known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will his, <clears throat> he keep his anger forever. He hath not dwelt with us after our sins, nor rewardeth us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Amen. We'll continue with uh, Shout to the Lord. wanted the freedom to engage in immorality and other such. 
things, which was not permitted under the righteous king. The usual punishment for treason was death, but the king passed a law saying that anyone guilty of treason would be allowed to live if they had their eyes put out. On several occasions, young men were brought before the king to be tried for treason, and after carefully hearing the evidence, the king regretfully pronounced the penalty of blindness upon some of these young, rebellious men. One day, the king's sheriff brought a young man before the court to be tried for treason. It was rumored that he was the ringleader of the rebellion. The king was disturbed by the hood covering the upper body of the prisoner, but the court lawyers requested that the concealment remain in place to assure that justice would be accomplished. The king went along with the request, assuming that the accused must be an acquaintance or perhaps the son of some state official. He <coughs> heard the evidence that proved to be over overwhelmingly incriminating. When it came time to pass the sentence, the lawyers removed the hood to reveal the king's own son. The king was about to pass the sentence of blindness on his only son, when with great restraint of his emotions, he announced that he would wait 24 hours to produce, pronounce the judgment. Though it could not make a difference in the court's decision, the king used the time to no avail, trying to bring his son to repentance. The son felt sure that the father could not forgive him and that the penalty of the law was unavoidable. During the intervening time, word of the developing situation spread over all the kingdom. There was much speculation about what the king would do. Half of the people characterized the king as a man who placed duty and the letter of the law above his own feelings. They supposed the king would not only take out his son's eyes, but would also have him executed as an example to others. Then there was the other half of the kingdom that believed the king would yield to his deep feelings toward his son and free him unharmed. Many believed that he would elicit from the son a promise of allegiance and then set aside the penalty of the law. The king found himself in a dilemma with two conflicting compulsions. He desired to save his son and he desired to remain the just and lawful king. Having blinded others for the same offense, could he make an exception with his son and still maintain the public perception of being just? How could the public continue to respect his rule? Furthermore, if he should withhold the punishment, how could he command respect or control of his son then? The offense would forever stand between the king and his son, if not punished. And would not the rebellion be in his son be even bolder? On the other hand, how could he pass a sentence on his own son? Could a father who begat a son of his own body and invested so much time and love and energy in rearing him suddenly shut off all of his feelings? Could he just blind his son and forget? Would life ever have any meaning for the father? Well, 24 hours later, the court was reconvened. Uh, the royal city was packed with expectant, solemn onlookers. The prisoner was brought into the court. His face not being covered, his bitterness was clear for all to see. Looking at his countenance, one would think that he was holding his father responsible for his rebellion. The king was the last to enter the chamber. With expectancy running high, he was led to the chamber wearing the same hood his son wore the day before. Feebly, he was steered to his place on the throne. He immediately commenced to recount the incriminating evidence. Then, while the crowd stood in hushed wonder, just when he was preparing to pass the sentence, he reached up, slipped off the hood from his head, and the audience fell back in revulsion as they saw two gaping, bloody holes where their royal eyes had once been. The crowd gasped as the king addressed the, the general public. A servant placed before the people a tray containing the king's eyes, and the king asked, if common justice would be served by the substitution of his own eyes for his son. While the people unanimously agreed that justice was served, and the king had found a way to be faithful to the law, whereby maintaining its integrity and a way to justify his love for his son. 
but one brother remained, the son's rebellion. Had the father been able to elicit a prior uh, repentance from the son, the sacrifice would have seemed justifiable. But the offering had been made when the son was still a self-proclaimed enemy of the king. That too was resolved in the king's bloody sacrifice, saying that the father's love and forgiveness, the son was moved to repent for his father. All doubt to the father's love and wisdom involuntarily vanished, and the son fell at his father's feet and begged forgiveness that he had already received. He was placed at the father's right hand, where he forever thereafter faithfully and benevolently assisted in the affairs of the kingdom. The dilemma had been solved. Sacrificing neither his love nor his <clears throat> his love to his son, nor justice, the law had been honored in a way that elevated it as never before. The king had not only expressed his love to his son, but he brought him to humble repentance. The integrity of the kingdom was maintained, and the son was saved, all at the father's expense. Beautiful example, I think. Uh, most of us can identify who the characters are, but let's have one of the Sunday school age kids tell me who is the um, son in represent in the parable. Who does the son represent? Don't know Micah. No. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot there. But... Oh, how about one of the adults then? Who does the son represent? Me. <laughs> Me. That's right. Every one of us were dead in our trespasses and sin, rebellious toward the Father, our Maker. And so, who does the King represent? Brooklyn, you know that one? Who does the King represent then if we re represent the Son? Um, Jesus. Hey, good job. Jesus. The king sacrificed his own eyes, and in, our, in Jesus' case, he sacrificed his own life. The very thing. Sacrificed his own blood on the cross. So, anyway, I thought that was very fitting since uh, we're going to sing next uh, hymn number 471 Love Found the Way. And we're going to stand again. Thanks for that. <laughs>
Hymn number 17, Come Thou Fount. <laughs>
Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat to go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining at the rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, and cried out. For they all saw him, and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them, and said to them, Be of good cheer, as I do not be afraid. Then he went into the boat to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure, and marveled. For they had not understood about the loaves, because their heart was hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Genesaret and anchored there. And when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized them, ran through the whole surrounding region, and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he entered, into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment, and as many as he has touched them were made well. Between the area of Bethsaida and Dennis Red is about eight kilometers. So this is not a long trip for these guys in the boat. Cape Name is about in the middle of it all, and this is Jesus' home base. And if you read through the book of Mark, uh, it goes from north to south, and basically he's been there for two years, and uh, he's worked his miracles, he's taught the disciples and everything else, um, but they still don't have a clue who he is. And he's fed the 5,000, and it says they took up 12 baskets full, 12 baskets, 12 disciples. So these were smaller baskets he's going to carry. And so you can imagine the disciples as they fed the 5,000, getting their baskets full of bread from the Lord Jesus. Remember the Lord Jesus, he only had a few loaves of bread. And he would keep filling their baskets. He would keep filling their baskets. Every time they came by, they'd go to the next group of 50 individuals and, and drop off bread in their little group. And then they go back to the Lord Jesus and he'd keep filling their baskets. And you think after a few hundred fillings, they, they get it. <laughs> they, they know who this guy was. And, you know, he's providing bread and he doesn't have a wheat field out there. And he doesn't have a factory behind him. And there's not a U-Haul that's pulled up behind him and with all kinds of bread. But he keeps filling the baskets up for them. But they still don't get it. So he sends the disciples away. He sets the stage. For their next lesson. He just doesn't do the miracles just because uh, he wants to do good things. No. He does the miracles and he does the teaching to reveal who he is. It is all about who he is. He can fill up bread. He can make it fall from the sky like he did in the days of Moses. But no. He's showing the disciples who he is and, and who those in the area that he's in. So he sets the stage. The disciples are sent into the middle of the sea, just as it's dark. Jesus is in the land, and he sends everybody else home that's been fed. He sends them all home. And then all of a sudden, there's a great wind, and the Lord Jesus can see them out in the distance. And he can see them struggling, that they're struggling in the wind. These are guys are sailors. They know what they're doing. But they're struggling. Now, when you and I, if we go out for a leisurely walk or a stroll or do anything, we're not going to go in the storm. If we go out for a walk and we go for a boat ride, we're going out when the weather's pretty calm, and we're going to go with the wind at our back. The Lord Jesus didn't send them out there with the wind at their back. And uh, so he sees them straining at the rowing, and they're struggling. And he sees them from about five miles away. He can see that. He can see what they're doing. He can see what they're going through. He has no problem with that. He 
Nathaniel. You can see him as well. He knew Nathaniel's heart. There was no deceit in his heart as well. And you can see Nathaniel sitting underneath the tree, underneath the fig tree. He knows our hearts. He knows physically what we're doing. He, he knows all about us. And he sends them out. In Psalm 53, verse 2, it says, God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand who see God. You know, he's looking down and he sees all our circumstances. And so he heads out there to see what they're doing. And so he goes out to them. And they were in the dark. And he saw them straining. And so about the fourth watch, three or four in the morning, he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, and cried out to him. And they were all troubled. And he said, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. These guys didn't know who he was. <coughs> but let's give them some slack. The Lord Jesus has not been crucified yet. That would not happen for another year yet. They, have, they don't have the completed scriptures like you and I have. We have the New Testament. They didn't have that yet. We have the Holy Spirit to teach us. They didn't have that yet. Well, they had all the Old Testament scriptures, but as you know, they really never got the right understanding of it. So they didn't know who he was yet. But you and I, we, we don't have that, that excuse. We, we have the Word of God. We have the complete Word of God. we got the, the Spirit of God to teach us the things of God. And, and we can understand who He is. But He goes out to them. And He says, Be of good cheer, as I. Don't be afraid, as I. I am. Essentially, you can translate it. I am. Now, they would have understood that. They would have understood that phrase. Moses, as he would have approached God in that burning bush, and the Lord, God was going to send him out on a mission to redeem Israel out of Egypt. And Moses' his first objection was, Who am I that I should go? And God answered, Well, I'll be with you. Not about you, Moses, but I'll be with you. And his second objection is, When I come to the children of Israel and and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God says, I am who I am. I am have sent you. They would have understood that. They would have understood that the one that's standing on the water in front of their boat is God Almighty. He was the I am. And who this man is, is more important than who I am, or what I can do. Who this man is, is much more important. And so, they're out in the water, and he's standing before them. And we never read the part about where Peter walks on the water, because I don't want to keep picking on him. But uh, we'll leave that for another day. But he's outside. And he's storming and they're struggling. And he tells them, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. We'd all have to admit that in our North American Christian culture, to be of good cheer would mean we have everything going our way. That is, uh, my little prayer checklist would all be answered by God by Friday at 4 o'clock, so I could have a good weekend. Well, we'd have it all sorted out. So that's, that would be our idea of good cheer. Good health, good job, kids all doing well. And we can agree on all those circumstances, and we can agree with the Lord Jesus to be a good cheer. Okay, I could not. But that's not their case. He's out on the stormy water. They're still struggling in the boat. He said, be of good cheer. Remember the story of Stephen. He's calling on God. He says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. As 
because the storms are coming at them. And he says, Lord, do not lay this charge against them. Paul and Silas were beaten in the prison, put in the inner prison, fastened their feet in the stocks, and there they are praying and singing hymns. And we know about the conversion of the jailer. <coughs> Martha Snell Nicholson, if you ever get an opportunity of reading any of her poetry, she was a young lady and uh, had tuberculosis and, and all kinds of, she had one time four life-threatening diseases. And she wrote marvelous hymns, marvelous uh, poems with four life-ending diseases. To top it off, she lived longer than her husband. She never stopped loving the Lord Jesus. In John chapter 16 and verse 33, we're told, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He's overcome the world. Here, here is he standing on the stormy seas and they're still struggling, but he's overcome the world. David Gooding in his book, In the School of Christ, he, he wrote a book covering John chapter 13 through 17, marvelous book. In his, in his subject on the assurance of victory, he says, if we in our gener generation would rise and witness to the reality of Christ before our contemporaries, we too must learn the secret of overcoming the world. And he says, and here it is in the words of one of Christ's apostles, for whatever is begotten of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. That's all it takes. That's what it takes to overcome the world. And all that, on all that's in it, and all that opposes us, is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He calms the storm. The psalmist says, so his waves are still. He says, be of good cheer, is I. And we can be of good cheer. Because he is the I. We can be of good cheer. So then he stops the storm. But it says, and the disciples were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and, and marveled. He'd already crossed before with them on a previous crossing and a great windstorm arose and he told the wind and sea peace be still and the wind stopped. It's amazing how you can just stop the wind. And it ceased and there was a great calm. And Mark records their question. Mark wasn't in the boat, but he records the question. Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Amazing. Get anybody else to go out there and stop the wind and they won't be able to do it. Well, they can harness to put up a windmill, but it's about all they can do. It says they greatly marveled. They were amazed. These are not expressions of faith, though. These are not expressions of faith. Jesus raised the girl from the dead and it says they were overcome by great amazement. They, they, they saw this girl raised from the dead and they were all amazed, the crowd. Didn't mean they believed in him. A guy named Simon who practiced sorcery in the city of Samaria and astonished the people, claiming to be someone great. And he says, All the people were amazed. They, there was no faith there. They were just amazed and awed at something that had happened. Felt would go and preach the gospel. And then Simon and others believed and were baptized. That's the essence of faith. They believed in the gospel. We have generations of citizens and family members who live in our midst. And they've seen marvelous things. They celebrate Christmas, they celebrate Easter, and they, and they heard the stories of, of the Lord Jesus' miracles and, and not saved. Amazed, but not saved. 
But what's wrong with the disciples? What did they miss? And so Mark records for us in verse 52 what they missed. But they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. This is what they missed. All disciples call baskets and the bread keeps coming in. They missed it. I think the disciples handed about 500 loaves each to about 9,000 people. Each time they went back, the baskets were filled. It's amazing. But that's what they missed. They didn't understand about the loaves. They didn't understand that the one who was supplying the bread was God himself. That Jesus was God. Satan even tempted the Lord Jesus one time. Turned the rock into bread, but he said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You know, a philanthropist, he can buy a lot of bread and, and pull it up to a place and, and, and feed tens of thousands of people. We see it happening all the time in different places where they need refugee camps. But he had to have the bread made, he had to have it bought, he had to have it delivered, packaged. The Lord Jesus didn't need any of that. Philanthropists can do that, but he's not God. The Lord Jesus, on the other hand, he is God. So they didn't understand about the loaves. Their heart was hardened. And we see that throughout, throughout the scriptures. Where the nation of Israel, their, their heart is hardened. Their eyes were blinded and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn and so that I should do it. Again, they're so ingrained in the law, they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. They have a spiritual enemy as well. Their minds were blind, they were told in 2 Corinthians 3, for until this day the same veil remains. Un unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. <clears throat> Having a conversation earlier brings us hope that those that are absorbed in the law they don't see Christ at all. They have no perception of who he is. All they see is the law. But we're told that law and the veil is taken away in Christ that with when Christ is put into the picture on every occasion, we get the mind and heart of God. And we know who He is. Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained and the rest of blind. You know, we, we have something so precious for those that have put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. We have what they were blinded to, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have the people, they've come to the land now, <clears throat> and the people recognize who Jesus is. They know him by sight, by hearing, by certain signs. They know this person, the Lord Jesus Christ. They know who he is. They comprehend who he was. And it says, and they brought everybody to him. When they got there in the morning, everybody was brought to him. Everyone that had a need was brought to the Lord Jesus. You know, over 95% of the world's population is a health problem. We all got it. Only a few in here, these young kids, they're both the only ones who don't get <laughs> Mental health issues are on the rise. Physical deformities, drug abuse, all kinds of abuses on the rise. Crimes are increasing, and the law won't fix them. And the law won't fix them. The Lord Jesus can bring that person to the Lord Jesus. But God has a plan, you know. He has a plan. And it says in Revelation 21, verse 4, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. Eliminate all those things out of your life, and, and then you don't have a problem. 
There'll be no more pain for the former things have passed away. And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things. <coughs> you and I, one day, we're going to be brought up to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and all things are going to be made new. Our bodies are going to be changed more. We're going to be incorruptible. You won't be able to sin. Amazing. We might last five minutes up here after we leave here, but in heaven will last an eternity. Incorruptible. But before that happens, the Lord Jesus told his disciples that he was going to leave them. He was going to leave them for a little while and, and send them out into the mission field to spread the gospel, the good news. And we get that picture. The Lord Jesus sent his disciples out into the sea. And he was on the land, he was left alone, he was praying with his father, having fellowship with his father. And we get the same picture today. He's up in heaven, he's with his father, and he sent us, sent us out into the world to spread the gospel. And he tells his disciples in another gospel, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, do I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And there's all kinds of things in this world that can trouble our hearts. All kinds of things in, in our homes that can trouble our hearts. But he says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice, because I said, I'm going to the Father. For my father is greater than I. And he's left. He went to the cross. He was buried. Three days he rose again. He met with his disciples. And then he left. And he sent his Holy Spirit. And we read at the end of Mark's Gospel. And they went and preached everywhere the Lord working with them. He hasn't abandoned us. By no means he has not abandoned us. But he's left us to do the work. We're not alone in the adventure. God is scripting the storyline. He fed the 5,000. It's evening. He sent the disciples out on the sea alone. He stayed back. He stayed with his father. And he waited until it was dark. Waited until they were in the storm. And then he went out to them. And then he told them peace. He didn't call them the storm. You know, the storm doesn't get calm until we're in the presence of the Lord Jesus. Until he got into the boat and the storm was calm. And you and I, as we continue on in the things of the Lord, we're going to have our struggles, guaranteed. But he hasn't abandoned us. By no means has he left us. He's left us with the Spirit of God to teach us the things of God. And we get to tell others about the Lord Jesus. There was a missionary couple, Matthew and Ruth Hillier. Uh, he was from Australia, she was from England. And uh, anyway, the Lord brought them together. And they had a passion for sharing the gospel. And originally they were in Australia. And then the Lord had them move to another place, to Moldova. They live in Zarnesti, Moldova, which is on the, the western border of Ukraine. And they have a little gathering of saints there. And uh, they've received up to this point about 500,000 refugees. So they have a, a camp there in an area there. And so the, the Hilliers have a base camp where they support the refugees. Around February, the uh, mother with uh, twin 18-year-old girls and a son came into the camp. They were from the Odessa region. They had been bombed and terrorized. And they were traumatized by the war and the shock. And, and somehow they made their way there. And so they had meals with them, and they had some casual conversation with the mother and 
with the two daughters and the son, and, but there was just no interest spiritually. But their, their needs were being met. They were invited to the assembly meetings, such as this, and, but they didn't show any interest. In May, the, a weekly girls' club was started. And the girls got interested and asked for a Russian Bible. Because most of the refugees spoke Russian. And, and so they were given a, a Russian Bible and the girls started attending the weekly meeting for the young girls in the young girls club. In June, the Hilliers thought, well, they wanted to start some children's camps. And decided that the second camp would be for the Ukrainian children. They had a number of them there. The Ukrainian refugees. Matthew, though, not very fluent in Russian, called Sergei and his wife Irina to come with a small Russian team to help in the camp. Here you got a Russian team of gospel workers coming to the Ukrainian to share the gospel with them. You can just feel the tension. Sergey and Irina met with the mom and their two daughters. Had some meals with them and they got along just fine. Sergey as well had a daily afternoon Bible study with his team. <clears throat> so he had his team of individuals there and they have a Bible study in the afternoon and, and the mom was overhearing this. And they got interested. And then the girls sat in. And four days after the Russian team arrived, the girls tell Matthew that they got saved. That they got saved. Here are these two 18-year-old girls bombed out of their own homes by the Russians. Cared for now by some missionaries of hill years. The gospel shared with them by Russian evangelists. Who could have scripted the story? And they got saved. And they were all excited. And their time in, in this camp was going to be limited because they were going to be moved out. But the twin girls also wanted to get baptized before the Russian team heads back to Russia. So on June 29th, the twin girls were baptized. And asked for a comment from the girls. The girls said they were thankful for the circumstances of war that led them to get saved. Forced them out of their homes, into Madola, into this refugee camp, where these missionaries were, where these Russian evangelists shared the gospel with them, and they got saved. Family's on the way to Germany now. Continue to pray for them. He sets the circumstances. It's not the way you and I would script the circumstances. But he does. He scripts the circumstances. And we might not see, we don't see today how it all is going to unfold. We really don't. We got tunnel vision and we got we're all short sighted. We only see what happens today. He's got the big picture in mind. He really does. So as, as he sent us out into this world to share the gospel with others, mind ourselves, be of good cheer. Lord Jesus says it is I, and we don't need to be afraid. Sends us out. We just have to cooperate with him as he goes along his business. Working through you, working through me, and sharing the gospel with others and seeing others come to Christ. Again, Lord, we're thankful for the opportunity we have here. Again, Lord, thank you that we're not we're not alone by no means. 
We have the Spirit of God and we have the Lord Jesus. And you direct our path. And so again, Lord, help us to have open eyes, open hearts, and circumstances before us to those that might we might share the gospel with. So again, Lord, uh, we would give thanks and ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.